Let me ask you a question. What do you expect out of other Christians? I mean, what do you expect from the Christians that you go to church with? that you see every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meetings, special meetings, all of that. I've heard people say, I've heard people say at our place, well, it may seem like a good church, but oh, if you only knew. There are problems in that church. Boy, are there problems there. I got news for you. There are problems in every church. I mean, does that really surprise you that there are people in church that have problems? Does it really shock you that there are people in church that are having a bad day? Some who've had a bad month. Some who for the last year, they've not been doing real well spiritually because of different things that have come into their lives or that they have allowed in their lives. I'll guarantee you that tonight there are people here who are needing something desperately from the Lord because they have been struggling. They've not told anybody. They've not said anything to anyone. And they've been hurting. And sometimes it's difficult for them to even smile. But they put on the face when they come to the house of God. And some dear sister, when that person doesn't look at them or some dear brother and smile at them but has a horrible expression on their face, suddenly gets offended and says, I can't believe that that person would be so cold to me. The reality is they may not have even known that you were standing right in front of them because of the things that they're going through in their life. Matter of fact, if I were to go back in Madison Baptist Church about 20 years ago, say 20 years ago, I think we were running about 250 at that time. 20 years ago, running 250, we had problems. Now, I'm not talking about a church split. I just simply mean... That many people coming together from so many different backgrounds, so many different socioeconomic backgrounds, racial backgrounds, every country backgrounds, every different kind of background. There are just some people that are going to get on the outs with one another from time to time. Even in my own family, with my two brothers and my two sisters, there are times that we get on the outs with one another. We still love one another, and we die for one another. But we just, uh, it just doesn't always go just sweet and roses and lovey-dovey and sprinkle it with a little bit of scented water and everything's fine. Life is not like that. So when we went up to 500, guess what? The problems did not double. They tripled. And I found this out. Everybody that comes into our church has their own set of baggage. And what happens is everybody's baggage gets spilled over every once in a while and their stuff gets mixed up with one another and no wonder there are problems. Then we got to running over 600. And guess what? More problems. The more people... It's not because they're Baptists. It has nothing to do with being Baptist. It has nothing to do with really being even independent Baptists. It has everything to do with the fact that we are dealing with people. Hmm. Say, it isn't supposed to be like that, is it, preacher? Well, no, in a perfect world, but we haven't been in a perfect world since the fall. I mean, what are you expecting? What are you expecting from other Christians? It seems like sometimes, almost every Sunday, I hear about one or two of the brethren that are upset with one another. God putting out with one another about something. A lot of times it's just silly stuff, but unfortunately it's not silly to them. Or somebody hears some rumor, and then they automatically repeat it. I tell the preacher boys at our church about the preacher's Miranda rights. Anything you say can and will be used against you, period. And when it's repeated, it's not going to be repeated in the context in which you said it. It's not going to be be repeated how you said it. It's going to be repeated how they took it, and you're guilty of it. Because that's life. I've learned that. I wish people would listen to what I say. They don't. They interpret what I say. And I am guilty of what they interpreting me have said and not what I said because they don't know what I said because as soon as I said it, they put it through their own little interpreting computer up here and something else comes out. (laughs) Man, that's people. You know, when God called me to preach, he called me to preach the last Sunday in January 1974, listening to missionary Charles Hocking, missionary to Brazil. 
And when he called me to preach, and man, I started making plans to go off to Bible college. It's going to be wonderful. I'm going to get to preach the Word of God. That's what I'm going to get to do with my whole life is preach the Word of God, tell people about Jesus, win souls, fight the devil, fight the world, stand for God. Won't it be wonderful? And yet it seems like I've had to spend far more of my time dealing with Christians. Having Christians, I mean, Christians get mad at you. The world, I mean, the people who are just of the world, the lost, they don't get near as mad at me as Christians get mad at me. I am shocked as much as I love people, and I do love people. I may yell a lot, but that's my nature. I yell a lot. All right? A lot of people yell a lot. I mean, we got presidential candidates that yell one another all the time. You're thinking about voting for them. So, hey, I'm yelling, vote for me. Okay, there we go. But I love people. We, we do things for people. But it just seems like the more you do for people, the more you, they hate you. I gave somebody not too long ago. They were hurting. They had a great financial need. We took up an offering. We gave them over $5,000. And I said, I hesitate giving this to you because you probably won't be here two months from now. I say, why won't they be here? They'll get mad and leave. You know, the people, we have lost more people that we have given thousands of dollars to than the people we've never given a dime to. I said one day in our church, I said, you know, listen, don't do this. Don't come to me and say, preacher, I'm 110% with you. Because I know you're gone. You're out of here. So I had one of the deacons left that day, and he said, preacher, I want you to know I'm 84% behind you. <laughs> He's not there anymore either. But anyway... I mean, man, you dedicate your life to serve the Lord. And it seems like no matter what you do, somebody doesn't like it. They get slammed from every direction. We had somebody not too long ago that gave over $40,000, wanted us to have a brand new Steinway piano. Now, I'm going to tell you, I can't really tell the difference between that brand new Steinway and the old Steinway that had the broken soundboard. And all. I, I can't tell the difference. Now, the people who can tell the difference, they oh, it's wonderful, it's great. We had people get mad at us for spending the $56,000 that we had to spend to get a $103,000 piano. That's a pretty good deal right there. I'll sell it to you. <laughs> Where did we ever get this idea that this was going to be easy? You know, I think we've swallowed that Hollywood nonsense about love. Oh, if man and woman are really in love with one another, they'll never have any problems. What planet? Come on. I look at the Bible. I look at the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul gets saved, and the church at Jerusalem won't receive him. Now, how's that, how's that for your introduction to Christianity? You meet Christ on the Damascus Road, you think everybody would be thrilled. No, they're hiding from him. They don't want anything to do with him. That's how he started out. In chapter 15, he gets into a fight with Barnabas over whether or not to take John Mark with him. Matter of fact, even before he gets into a fight with Barnabas, he has trouble with a bunch of believers that come from the Jerusalem church and are saying that he didn't preach right, that you've got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. And he gets in a great disputation with those people because of the false doctrine that they were teaching. Then when he starts to go on a second missionary journey, he and Barnabas get upset with one another over whether or not to bring John Mark with him. So, and I'm wondering, why does this guy continue on the mission field? I mean, he wasn't treated well by the church at Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 21, he comes back from his third missionary trip and when he gets back on his third missionary trip, he is bringing an offering from the churches that he started to the believers that were hurting at Jerusalem. And the Bible says they rejoiced when they heard what he had to say. And James calls them aside and said, We've heard a rumor. You're teaching people against the law of Moses. We've heard a rumor. We've we got six men going down to the temple. They're going to give a vow. We want you to go. That meant he had to go and pay for their vow. So he gets down to the temple. He pays for the vow. Somebody sees him that knew him from over around the Thessalonica area in Ephesus, and they see him. They say, hey, this is a man that brought a Gentile into the temple. He hadn't done it. Another rumor. So he gets arrested, 
at his first answer, he tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, no man stood with him. James didn't stand with him. The church at Jerusalem didn't stand with him. Nobody. You know what it, you know what's like? Hey, I've heard a rumor. Don't confuse me with the facts. A rumor's all I need to hear. We'll crucify church members over a rumor. And we don't know if it's true. We just know we heard it from a good source. Well, I don't think it's a good source that spreads rumor against God's people. The accuser of the brethren is the devil, and too many of the brethren seem to be in league with him. He starts the church at Corinth. He won the lost to Jesus, a big church at Corinth. I mean, that was a city of over 800,000 people, 200,000 free people, 600,000 slaves. He starts a church there. Three years later, he writes to them the book of 1 Corinthians. Here's the church he started. And these people are divided. They're going to law one against another. They've got a man in that church that's committing adultery with his father's wife, and the church is puffed up. Hey, we believe in grace. Aren't we a wonderful church? We don't judge anybody. All right, he's committing adultery with his father's wife. But hey, look how open-minded we are. He has to rebuke him for it. In chapter 6, he tells him, you're going to law one against another. Shame on you. In chapter 7, he has to straighten them up on marriage and divorce. In chapters 8 through 10, they were disobeying the Spirit of God from Acts chapter 15 by eating meat offered in sacrifice to idols. Now, we've not had to deal with that before, but you go to Costco and you go to some of these other grocery stores and in their meat department, they have halal meat. That is meat that has been offered to uh, Allah of Islam. You going to eat it? God says you're not to. The Holy Ghost of God, read it in Acts chapter 15. This is one of the necessary things that Christians were not to do, eat meat offered in sacrifice to idols. And he spends three chapters, chapters 8, 9, and 10, dealing with that subject in 1 Corinthians. In chapter 11, these people had gotten so far astray, they didn't even understand that which nature understands. And that is that there's to be a difference in appearance from the neck up for men and women even when they pray. He says, does not even nature itself teach you if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. He says, man, you don't even need a Bible to know that's wrong. Nature teaches you that's wrong. They were messed up on the Lord's Supper. Many had partaken of the Lord's Supper unworthily and because of that, Many of them were sickly, and because of that, many of them had died. This is the church he started. Chapters 12 through 14, each of them were puffed up about their gifts. What a divided church. In chapter 15, he has to straighten them out on the resurrection, and in chapter 16, he takes up an offering. How's that for preaching? And then he expects an offering, and he got it. Well, he sends the letter down to the church at Corinth. He sends a second letter. In the second letter, they at least did what they were supposed to do about the man taking adultery with, the father's, his, with, the man taking adultery with his father's wife. But in that letter, he lets us know that there were several charges that people had laid against him. You know, even when some people get right at church, there's always some who don't. I mean, after all, you smite a scorner, and he'll hate you. You get yourself a blot. But you rebuke a wise man, he'll be yet wiser. You realize that when you get rebuked from the pulpit by the Word of God, you reveal what kind of person you are by how you respond. If you're a wise man, you'll take it and you'll learn from it. If you're a scorner, and he's, you know, people say, man, I like it hot. Yeah, until he st- you, want to, you want somebody to step on your toes except for the one that's got the corn on it. I got news for you. Man of God's going to hit all ten of those toes. Had one guy go out one day. He said, wow, preacher, you really stepped on my toes today. I said, I'm sorry. I was aiming for your heart. But anyway, (laughs) the apostle Paul, who had started that church, he was accused of vacillation in chapter 1, verses 17 and 18 of 2 Corinthians. He was accused of being untrustworthy in chapter 8, verses 20 through 23. In chapter 10 and verse 2, Paul was accused of being worldly. In chapter 10 and verse 10, he was of unimpressive appearance. 
He was accused of having contemptible speech in chapter 10, verse 10, and chapter 11, and verse 6. He was even accused, the Apostle Paul, get this, of being unqualified to teach, chapter 11, and verse 5, and chapter 12, and verse 11. He had a lack of dignity, they said, in chapter 11, and verse 7. And he was even accused of being deceitful in chapter 11, verses 16 through 19, chapter 12, and verse 6, and also verses 16 through 19 there. He writes to the Galatians. These were people that he had won to Christ. These were people when he came and gave them the gospel, he said, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. He says, where is the blessedness that you spake of? And then Paul says in verse 18, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Imagine that. These people would have died and went to hell had Paul not gone to them. And now they hate him. It shouldn't be like that. Chapter, uh, let's say in chapter 4 and verse 2, uh, matter of fact, our chapter 2, we read that passage. He even had problems with Peter and Barnabas when they were at Antioch. Barnabas. Peter stopped eating with the Gentile Christians at the Antioch church. He had to withstand Peter. Peter! He had to withstand Peter to the face. Philippians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul's in jail. He's at Rome. And there were some people that were emboldened to preach with this one motive, to add to his bonds. Here he's in jail for serving Jesus. He's lost his freedom because he was serving Jesus. And there are actually some Christians that were now emboldened to speak out to add to his bonds. That's amazing. Chapter 1 of first, or in 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, he had a couple of his converts, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who were shipwrecked in the faith. In 2 Timothy, chapter 4, he says, Demas had left him, having loved this present world. By the way, he said everybody had forsook him at his first trial. Nobody stood with him. That's been the lot of the Apostle Paul. And if you take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through the remainder of the chapter, you find all of the things he suffered that none of these jokers had suffered. And I'm looking at Paul and I think, why on earth do you keep going? The more you love them, the less you be loved. The more you serve God, the more the people of God seem to dislike you. The more you stand for God and stand for the Word of God, people turn against you. Paul, how on earth can you soar like an eagle when you worship with a bunch of turkeys? I mean, why on earth get saved if church is going to be like that? Why do it? I got a good reason, by the way, to keep them going to hell. Yeah, you can sit there and complain about the church if you want and die and go to hell and burn forever. Or you can come to Jesus and get born again and you'll find out that, hey, the Christians in the church aren't perfect, any more perfect than the people that were on the bar stool. Their sins may be somewhat different, but guess what? They still got sins. Why get involved in church at all if it's going to be like that? Why serve the Lord in reaching people if the more you love them, the less you be loved? As I said earlier, the people we've given the most money to and help to have turned away and hate us the most. Will curse us on the Internet. Will run us down. I got a man, he was, uh, he was riding a bicycle, tall guy, about six foot ten. He was riding a bicycle out in the country there around us, member of our church, had been a deacon at one time in our church, a dog ran out after him on the bike, ran underneath the wheel. He went flying, broke his left arm, broke his left leg, and fractured his pelvis. He was laying in the road. He couldn't even roll over. A lady had to come out that owned the dog, get the dog off of him, and stop him. We took up an offering for him, gave him almost $8,000. And as soon as he got well enough, he went to another church. Isn't that amazing? Makes me not want to help anybody. That's not right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
Oh, why serve the Lord if Christians are going to falsely accuse you? They're going to talk ugly about you. They're going to backbite and be angry and hold grudges. You know, it amazes me when people leave church over when pastors are talked about all the time. I mean, really. Maybe that's why some pastors can't stay at a place longer than a year. They get their feelings hurt and they run off. And I tell our guys, listen, if you're going to get your feelings hurt, you're going to stop serving God because you get your feelings. Don't even get started. Because I'll guarantee you, you serve God. Hey, they talked about Jesus. Do you realize that his own disciples murmured at the things he had to say in John chapter 6? When he got arrested, all of his disciples forsook him and fled. Even Peter. I'm glad Jesus didn't quit. He said, well, you sorry bunch of sorry disciples. I'm not going to the cross for you. That wasn't Jesus. I mean, is that why you do what you do so that people pat you on the back, say good things about you? And as long as you get recognition, you'll serve. But if you don't get the recognition you think you deserve, you're not going to serve. Man, I've had people go up to new members and say, now, you know, brother, you're going to hear Brother Allison preach against some things. He's going to preach against, he's going to preach on dress. He's going to preach on on." on uh, booze, he's going to preach on dress, he's going to preach on, on not touching before you get married, he's going to preach on dress, and, and, and you don't have to worry about that, you just come and enjoy the fellowship with them. I've had members do that, and most preachers have had members do that. You say, well, what's the point? How about this? Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. How about this? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. How about this? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Paul says, and the love of Christ constraineth me. You say, but preacher, that still doesn't answer the question. How can I soar like an eagle when I worship with so many turkeys? I'm going to tell you how. If you want to write it down. This will help you. Number one, draw close to the Lord. Uh, you see, our problem is we spend trying time to gr- trying to gather all the friends we can get, getting close to people. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting close to folks except our primary emphasis ought to be to draw close to the Lord. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Notice beginning in verse 7, the Apostle Paul is writing and he says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now look at this. That I may know him. Well, didn't Paul already know Jesus? Oh, yeah, he knew Jesus, but he wanted to know him better. He wanted to know him better. Man, what about the things he wrote? He already knew him pretty good. He wanted to know him even better than that. He said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Well, he's wanting to get close. He wants to know the power of the resurrection. But you know, that's where most of us stop. Look what he says next. And the fellowship of his suffering. I want to know what he went through. I want to experience. I want to feel what he felt. I want to know the suffering that Jesus went through for me. There aren't many of us that pray like that. Then he says next, being made conformable unto his death. Paul would get his wish, by the way, for later he'll say, I have finished the course, I've kept the faith, henceforth there's later for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also the love is appearing. 
draw close to the Lord. When I have, like a wife or a husband come to me and they're having severe marital problems, it looks like divorce, maybe the one is left and this is the one that's left. I can't promise them that they're going to get back together. I say, first of all, number one, above all things, whether your marriage gets back together or not, we want it to. We'll try to work to make that happen. But understand, he's gone. There's an awful lot you're going to have to put up with and go through in order for this to have any possibility whatsoever. But let me tell you what the most important thing is. It's not getting closer to your husband or to your wife. It's getting closer to Jesus. You need to concentrate on being the closest you've ever been to Jesus Christ. That means being in His Word. That means spending time in prayer. That means having a walk that is close to Him. Your children right now need to see a mom or dad, whatever the case is, that's walking close to God in the middle of trials. We tell our children, when trials come, turn to Jesus and He'll help you. And then we have some trouble in a marriage and the first thing we do is call a lawyer. What are we teaching our kids? We got divorced for the kids. Oh, yeah, and we vote in lottery and booze for the kids too. What kind of nonsense is this? How do we lie to ourselves? That's pretty tough right there, wasn't it? But draw close to God. It's not about us, folks. It's about Jesus. Isn't it interesting that in... 1 Corinthians chapter 11, after getting after the Corinthian church, and he's talking about the Lord's Supper. And he says, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He talked about the bread, do this in remembrance of me. Talked about the juice, do this in remembrance of me. In other words, what he was saying to that troubled church, hey church, it's not about you, it's about me. Think about me. Do this in remembrance of me. Forgive one another. Why? In remembrance of him. It's about him. You've been forgiven. Now you forgive. But it's just hard. I don't think it was real easy to go to the cross. I don't think it was real easy to have the nails pierce your hands. I don't think there was anything easy about having a crown of thorns put on your head. I don't think there was anything easy about having the scourge, the cat of nine tails, giving all those stripes. I don't think there was anything easy about having all your sin laid on him and him suffering the wrath of God on that cross for you, nothing easy about it. And you expect to have an easy Christian life? Draw close to Him. I mentioned yesterday that I've been reading this book, Killing Christians, dealing with people in Muslim lands who've gotten saved, and as soon as family finds out they're saved, they are marked for death. They are beaten. Often they are tortured. Sometimes they are killed. Other times they are simply exiled from everybody that they knew and loved. The things they put up with, the danger that they are constantly in. And these people would consider it an honor to be killed for Jesus. And we whine and cry because somebody looked ugly at us when we were walking down the middle aisle of the church. Draw close to Christ. That's number one. If you're not going to draw close to Christ, I'm sorry... All the things that can be brought your way are going to overwhelm you. You have to draw close to Christ. Number two, determine your goal. Paul did that. Look at chapter 3, verse 13 of Philippians here. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Huh. He says, I've got a goal. And my goal is I'm pressing toward the mark. I don't just want to know him better, but I want to serve him completely to the end. I don't want to stop before I get to the finish line. I want to be faithful all the way to the end. Yes, I've had people say, Preacher, when are you going to retire? I'm not retiring. Now, I may change jobs, meaning I may stop being a pastor and just be out there preaching all the time and still being a soul winner. I don't plan on stopping preaching until these lips can't utter words anymore. And if I'm still alive and can't talk, then I'm going to try to learn sign language. 
And if all I can do is just simply have somebody sit there and have dribble come out of my mouth, I'm going to tell my wife, you stick a track right there on my chest with a sign that says, read this. And when people come by, I'll go, oh, okay. I just want to serve Jesus till I die. Man, he saved me. I'm going to heaven because of him. I don't want to stop early. To the finish line, all the way. Have a go. I'm not stopping. Well, you know, I, I, they just had some hypocrites down there. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, see, what you're saying is those hypocrites are closer to the Lord than you are. You're going to let those hypocrites decide where you go to church, whether or not you're going to serve God. I mean, come on. It is about Jesus. Have a go. Stay faithful. Stay in your Sunday school class. Stay in your bus route. Keep going soul winning. Matter of fact, do you want to get even? Do you know how to get even with somebody? Here's how you get even with somebody. They do something bad to you. You take them out, buy them a big old juicy hamburger at Steak and Shake. Or buy them a shake. You know what you do then? You heap coals of fire on their head. Oh, isn't that fun? Go out and get them a $20 gift certificate of Cracker Barrel. And send it to you and say, man, I was praying for you today. Don't tell them what you was praying. That may get you in trouble. But <laughs> I was praying for you today, and I'm giving this to you because in Jesus' name I love you. Then they'll feel so bad about treating you so ugly, you'll heap coals of fire on their head. We don't think about that. No, we just decide we're going to get even by talking bad about them too. Get yourself a goal. I mean, it's just silly how we go all over the place. I don't know what it's like around here. I mean, you're out in the middle of cow country. I mean, this is just... I don't know where all you people come from. Are they like busting you in from Philadelphia or Baltimore? How do they do this? I know you're used to it, but I, this is amazing to me. But around Huntsville, Alabama... People like to play musical churches. <laughs> Listen, folks, there are some churches, every member of their church used to be a member at another independent Baptist church in town. They're not winning anybody. I can go around to different places around Huntsville. This church has 15 families out of our church. This church up here has five families out of our church. This church over here, they've got three families out of our church down there. And the cause of Christ has really been helped, hasn't it? It's just a lot easier to get a bunch of disgruntled people from other churches than it is to go out and knock on doors, get somebody saved, and then get them in and disciple them and teach them how to serve the Lord. I wouldn't want to be part of a church that all it did was just get people from other churches. I have a policy that I do this. I don't care if anybody else does it or not. But I have a policy. Somebody visits our church from another independent Baptist church, and I, I find out about it. And if I don't know anything about it, there's nothing I can do about it. But if I find out about it, the very next day I'm calling the pastor and saying, I want you to know you had a family that was here yesterday. I don't have a clue what's going on. I will not visit them unless you say, Preacher, would you please go see them? Maybe you can help them. But if you don't tell me that, I'm not going to say... Hi, bye, I'm not going to knock on their door, not going to do anything. It's just ethical. I mean, they are that pastor's sheep. They have the responsibility before God. I can appreciate that. I understand it. I got one, we, got, we got one guy in town. I've been there 26 years. I think he's been where he's at 28 years. And uh, they've got 15, at least 15 families out of our church. He's never called me one time. Well, I take that back. He did call me once. He had a family of our church was visiting him. About six months after they were there, he called me up and said, did this family cause you problems at your place? <laughs> I, I laughed. I said, yeah, if you'd have called me, I'd have told you early. There you go. You say, you hate that guy? No, I don't hate him. He does preach the gospel. How could I hate him? Just because I don't think he's ethical, that's another matter. But... You know, he'll have to answer God for that. I'm not going to go around town running that guy down. I'm not going to run that guy down to our church members. Because if they do get so disgruntled with me that there's nothing I can preach that will satisfy them, 
At least I know if they do go there, they'll get the gospel. So why should I be upset? There's a lot more people for us to win around Huntsville and Madison. You're getting quiet on me and you scare me when you do that. (laughs) Draw close to the Lord. Determine your goal. Number three, delight in the things of God. Back in chapter 1 of the book of Philippians. Isn't that funny how we start in Isaiah chapter 40? We've worked our way all the way up to Philippians. But in Philippians chapter 1, notice what he says. He says in verse, well, let's go to verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add afflictions to my bonds, the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice. Delight in the things of God. Delight that people get saved. I heard a famous preacher say several years ago, I was listening to him on the radio, and he said, you know what amazes me? That God blesses people that disagree with me. How can he do that? Because he does. He's blessed me, and I sure don't deserve his blessings. Why wouldn't he bless them? They don't deserve his blessings. We got way too much envy going on among the people of God today. Way too much envy. We need to delight in the things of God. I rejoice when I hear about people getting saved. I don't. It, I, I, now I want. Listen. I want to see them saved at our place. But I like to hear that we're not the only ones seeing people saved. I want other people to see people saved. There's plenty of sinners to go around for all of us. Just go out and get them. Delight in the things of God. Even before he wrote that scathing letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, he praises them. Tells them they've come behind in no spiritual gift. He says some good things about them. Here's what I try to do. I, I try, when I talk about our people... Uh, yeah, we got problems because everybody's got problems, but I've got a lot of sweet, wonderful folks. I just don't have any perfect people. You don't either. But I got some people who are really strong in some areas of their walk with God, and they're struggling in some other areas. That's why I'm there. One of the things pastors like to say to one another, you know, the ministry would really be great if it wasn't for people. But if it wasn't for people, there'd be no ministry. Which means I'd have to get a real job. (laughs) This is not a job. This is a calling. Amen. People say all the time, Preacher, I wouldn't have your job for all the money in the world. I said, listen, I wouldn't have my job for all the money in the world. Because it's not about the money. God called me to serve him. And that is what it's about. I want to do that till I die. Then, no, well, this is not finally. I got one, two to go. (laughs) Number four, delete bitterness by forgiveness. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Remember, draw close to the Lord, determine your goal, delight in the things of God. Listen, if you want to soar like an eagle while you're worshiping with a bunch of turkeys, here's what you got to do. All right, in chapter 12, notice verse 14. He says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any, look at this, root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many are defiled. You know, our mouths have become spigots of bitterness. We've got to tell our best friend. And we've got to tell our second best friend. And we've got to put it on our Facebook page, how somebody hurt us. And we've got to start our own web blog and tell how that church down there, they weren't paying attention to me, but they were hurting, but they took up an offering for somebody else. That church down there, all it is is just a church full of cliques. Now, what is that? Let me tell you, you know, you know, Jesus, among his own disciples, had cliques. He had more than 12 disciples. 
There were over 500 at one time that saw him after his resurrection, but he had 12 that were in the 12 click. He had 70 that were in the 70 click that he sent out at one time. He had three among the 12 that were in the three click. Jesus did. How about that? You know what that usually means when they say, oh, nothing but clicks down there? That means that the one that you really want to be in, they're not letting you in. Start your own. <laughs> hey, man. Start your own. <laughs> you know, if you want to have friends, you just got to show yourself friendly. Proverbs, by the way. Instead of looking around, there's some people, we have a shake hand song, and you can see them. They're looking around to count how many's going to come over and shake their hand. They never leave their pew. They never move a foot to leave their pew. They're just sitting there in judgment on how many people come around and shake their hand. But if you've gotten like that, you need to get right with God. You need to be one of the very first ones to hit an altar and say, Oh, God, forgive me. If you leave a church without your hand shook, it's one person's fault, yours. I doubt there are people here that if you went up and said, Hey, good to see you tonight, I doubt there's anybody here that wouldn't shake your hand. Just go around shaking. Come up from behind them. Sneak up on them. They don't know who you are. You put your hand out there. Shake your hand. Delete bitterness by forgiveness. Oh, but preacher, you don't know how much they hurt me. I know. I don't know how much they hurt you, but Jesus knew how much anybody would ever be hurt. Listen, this is powerful. Turn over to Mark chapter 11. I got so many verses I could throw out right now because bitterness is destroying our churches. I quoted yesterday from... Ephesians chapter 4, Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and so on. Well, notice, we've got first a prayer promise. He says in verse 22 of Mark chapter 11, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, That whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Don't stop reading there. Next verse. And when ye stand praying, forgive. If any have ought against any, or if ye have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. You know, I'm convinced there's a lot of us that get down to pray and we can't get through. We're unforgiving because unforgiving because we don't forgive. Hey, Jesus said it. While you're praying, forgive. Get rid of the bitterness. Uh, listen, I deal, I've had to deal in counseling with all kinds of horrible situations. All kinds of, from child sexual abuse to different things. And how on earth do you deal with this when the person who did them wrong is now dead? They can't go to them, they can't rebuke them, they can't talk, but they're still carrying it around with them. Forgiving is simply taking it off the account. Forgiving is where you are giving up the right to ever bring it up again. Now, even some people that may have wronged you years ago with whatever they did, they never think about it. You think about it all the time. By not forgiving, by not taking it off the account, there's only one person paying for it, and that's you. You're letting them continue to hurt you every day of your life, and you're doing it by choice. Just forgive them so you can get on with your life. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, it is impossible, but what offenses will come? Do you realize it is impossible to live on this planet without somebody offending you? And it is possible to live on this planet, impossible to live on this planet without offending somebody else. So he says, forgive. Take it off the account so you don't bring it up anymore because that bitterness that's hidden down in here doesn't just defile you. It defiles everyone you talk to about it. Forgive. Last thing. 
die to self. 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Jesus, or Paul said, I die daily. Now, if the old man's been crucified with Christ, why do I need to die daily? You know, preachers have some of the same problems. Well, they have all the same problems everybody else has. You know, the Bible warns us preachers, if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. I mean, what I am, what am I? I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's all I am. I mean, anything that I've had happen to me that was good is a gift from him. The fact that we've had people saved, if he didn't save them, they wouldn't have got saved. He's done it. All I can do is deliver the message. I can't make people get right with God. He has to convict. He has to deal with them. And when they respond, he gets the glory for it because it's his work. My job is really pretty easy. I'm just to give the message. And if people come forward and get right, I've still done my job. If people don't come forward and get right, I've still done my job. Don't worry about it. Well, man, we had 300 people in attendance last, uh, last week. We had 300 decisions. Really? What a meeting. Ah, not so much. It was 3, 4, and 297 against. What are you going to do with God's message? I mean, after all, draw close to the Lord, determine your goal. You say, what does that mean to die daily? I heard, I think it was Dr. Lee Robertson give this illustration about a young man, might have even gone to him, I don't know, but uh, went to some professor, I guess, and he said, uh, what do you mean dying daily? He said, you know, preacher so-and-so, the guy that had just died not too long before, well-known preacher, and the young man said, yes, I know him. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out to his grave, and I want you to stay there for three hours. And in three hours' time, I want you to say any bad thing you can possibly think about him, whether it's true or not, just say it. So the young man said, man, I'd feel foolish standing out there at his grave and telling him he's a sorry preacher and, and he was a sorry Christian and, and uh, he was never any good. He said, you want to find out how to die daily? He said, yes, I do. He said, okay, go out there and do it. The young man said, I will. So he stood at the grave for three hours. And for three hours, he said every ugly, bad thing without cussing that he could say to that preacher there in the grave. He came back to his mentor and he said, uh, well, I did it. I felt awful foolish doing it, but I did it. And he said, well, what did he say? <laughs> well, he didn't say anything. He's dead. He said, that's your first lesson. Now I want you to go back out there tomorrow. And I want you to stand over that grave for three hours and I want you to say every flowery, nice, good thing you can possibly say about him. So he went out the next day and he stood over the grave. What wonderful messages you preach. You preach this and thousands were saved and you preach that and you preach here and there. He comes back and the guy said, did you do it? He said, yes, three hours. I, I just told him all the wonderful things that he was. He said, well, what did he say? He didn't say anything. He's dead. That's the second lesson. You die daily. Whether people love you. See, too many of us, we get our self-worth on the basis of how people talk to us. Man, I'm a child of a king, whether you like me or not. Now, I'm human enough to say, I'd like you to like me. But I've told our folks at our church, hey, I love you people. I love you with all my heart. But I want you to know this. I love God more. I've got one person I've got to please when I stand in the pulpit, and that's God. If you're not happy with me, deal with it because I want to please God. And that's what you need, a preacher who wants to please God. See, I'm thrilled to death. I talk about problems in the church. You're in a great church. This is an amazing church. In so many different ways. Man, I preach all over. It's an amazing church that you can have a second generation pastor and the church is still moving on. Hadn't changed. Still standing by the book. Not trying to bring in rock music. Not trying to bring in a new evangelical lifestyle and all kinds of weird programs. You've got a guy that loves God and wants to keep you going in the way that God should go in to begin with. You know how few churches you can say that with? I could go down 
to Highland Park Baptist Church. No, I can't. It's not even there. When I was a member there in Chattanooga, they had 10,000 in attendance every Sunday morning. And today, there is no Highland Park Baptist Church. They've got a church of the Highlands, not even Baptist, that meets several miles away in that big, gigantic auditorium that seated 6,500 people. Some other group's got the building now. I've been here a few times. Man, I've seen what God's done here and what God is continuing to do in this place. All right, you got pinched a little bit. Somebody said something bothered you a little bit. Get before God, get over it. Draw close to the Lord. Set your goals that you're going to determine your goal. Delight in the positive. Delete bitterness by forgiveness and just die to self. And they shall mount up with wings as eagles. But you've got to make some decisions. And if you do, you'll find God using you in a great place for His glory.